Hi everyone, welcome back to another video and we are continuing our series on stats today talking about how we demonstrate significance and if there's one video that is the most important thing to take away from my channel, it is it is this. So I say this a lot, I've said this before, that the p-value is very, very important. And when I'm on any call-in show or any other show where I say, can you demonstrate that this is significant, this is what I mean. The p-value is how we determine statistical significance. If you can't show me your p-value, I'm not quite convinced that what you're saying is true and that there is a causal relationship. So it's funny to say, let me see your p-value. Yeah, it's funny. It sounds like something kind of dirty and, and people chuckle at it, but it's actually true. I want to see your p-value. If you are coming to me saying that there is a causal relationship between x and y, I want to see this number. And if you can calculate this number and it is within a significant range and your study was performed correctly, then I am way more likely to believe what you're saying. So this is very, very important. We like p-values. So what is a p-value? A p-value is the calculated probability of finding the observed results assuming that h naught is true. So remember, h naught is the null hypothesis, which is our default or assumed position that there is no difference between the control group and the experimental group. So what this means is that if I assume that there is no difference, what is the likelihood that the results for the test statistic is falling within a range that would be expected if there is no difference? So I'm going to run a test, I'm going to do a bunch of math, and I'm going to get a number. What is the likelihood that that number falls within range of the control group? So we're trying to demonstrate if how similar these groups are, assuming that there's no difference. If I get a number that is outside the range of expected one time, cool. That's something that is, it still could be a coincidence. It's less likely to be because I demonstrated that it is less likely to fall within the average. But if, let's say, I repeat that study again and again, and I keep getting numbers that have a low probability of aligning with the null hypothesis, that kind of tells me, hey, Maybe we can reject the null hypothesis. So we are using the p-value as criteria to reject the null. And there are some limitations, of course, with p-value. There are limitations. And if you are advanced in stats, um, you might know these, and we'll talk about them later. But for now, for basic stats, if the p-value is significant, you are going to reject the null hypothesis. So this is very important to know. So what criteria do I mean? So generally, if your p-value is greater than 0 0.05, it's not significant. So that would mean anything greater than a 5% chance of uh, being aligning with the null hypothesis, that's not significant. It's like, hey, I have a 95% chance that this is going to be the average that we saw before. Whereas if we take a p-value and it's now 5%, so it's 0 0.05 or less than that, that's a 5% chance that it aligns with the control group average. That's a 5% chance that the study, that the number you found aligns with that other average. And so this number gets smaller and smaller. So let's take 0 0.001. So this is a very low, this is even beyond a 0 0.01, beyond, this is less than a 1% chance of equaling the control group average. If you repeated the study and kept getting a number that was 0 0.001 probability of, of being within that control group average, it's safe to say that there is a difference. 
So anything greater of a p-value than 0 0.05, generally, and this relates to alpha, uh, but anything greater than 0 0.05 is not significant. And we will not reject the null hypothesis anything greater than that. Anything equal to or less than 0 0.05 is deemed significant. And we can reject the null. And then a p-value less than or equal to 0 0.001 is very, very highly significant, and we can pretty safely reject the null in those cases. So let's illustrate this out a little bit, because it's difficult to wrap our minds around this in just words. Let's bring out our graph. So we have our bell curve. We are assuming that this is a normally distributed curve, no skew, nothing crazy. This is just a bell curve. So if we take our numbers here, so we have the bell curve and we have only a few, a few people that end up on this extreme left side of the curve and only a few people on this extreme right side of the curve. So most of the population is going to fall into this middle category. This is most likely. So if I were to calculate an average for a group of people in a study, it's very likely that I'm going to end up within this middle part within the 95% chance of getting in this range. It's less likely that I'm going to get a number in these edges here. If I were to grab a person at random from a population uh, for whatever statistic I'm looking for, for caffeine relating to test grades, um, it's more likely that I'm going to find somebody that fits within this average population and not very likely that the one person I picked is going to be from these, these edges. So that's what we're doing. That is, is precisely what we're doing with the p-value. So if we know that this is the distribution, what we're going to talk about is the critical value. And this is related uh, to the a point on, on this graph. So... Think about a point on this curve. If I select that point where the pink value is, I'm going to get a number. And that's the number of some average. This is the critical value. But beyond this, we are actually looking at the area underneath the curve. So the point's kind of important only to find the horizontal value um, of this. But I really care about the area from the tail up until this critical value. So it looks like this, not that. It looks like this on the picture. So if the area from the tail to the critical value is, is this shaded in teal, the critical value is how we are determining our significance. So if we hit the critical value, Anything to the right side in this area of the critical value is significant. We are defining our terms. This is all that's happening. If you're thinking about a philosophical argument, right, you need to define your terms. You need to make sure that you are all on the same page with what you mean when you say certain things. This is what we're doing here with the critical value. We are defining our parameters for what is significant. So the critical value defines the point at which we consider the data to be significant. So if we are to the right, all of the area to the right of the critical value is significant. And if our point falls within this, we can reject the null hypothesis. On the flip side, if I am to the left, look at how much area there is on the left. If I'm only calculating this tiny area here, most of the graph is to the left of that area. So if I get a value anywhere else over here, we are defining this as not significant. So we do not reject the null if our test statistic falls on this side of, of the graph. And this is assuming that we have a one-tailed test. I did that intentionally because it's easier. Um, Two-tailed tests, you would just divide this teal area in half and put some of it on the other side. But that's a conversation for a different time. 
The point is the area from the tail to the critical value where you have defined significance is really what matters. And that is where we are going to insert uh, our test statistic or the data that we measured in our study. So these are just our definitions. This is what we defined as significant. So I'm going to do my test. I'm going to run my study. I'm going to gather my data with my average and I'm going to plot it on this same graph. So let's say I get a number, and this is going to be our test statistic. This red line here is the test statistic. So I, I draw my point. I make the same line up through the graph. And then the area, similarly to the teal here, is the p-value. So if this teal area relates to alpha, remember our, our significance level is alpha. Uh, which usually is 0.05, and that's how we get our p-value up here of, of 0.05. But this is what is defining our significance. We put in our test statistic, and this example here is showing the test statistic to the right of the critical value. So I measured this test statistic, I plotted on the graph, and then the area from the tail, the very extreme tail all the way stopping at the test statistic, is the p-value. So we are comparing the area of this dark blue to the area of the light blue. If the area of p is less than the area of alpha, we can assume significance. This is this meets our criteria. If you plot this, look at the at the chart. This is to the right of the critical value. It meets criteria for significance. We reject the null. This is significant data. If the test statistic were to fall anywhere else, it would be not significant. We reject. We do not reject the null. So that's a little bit confusing, um, but we're going to talk about how we get the p-value, and this will come more in later videos as well because each different test that we do has a slightly different way of getting our p-value. So how do I calculate P? If I'm asking you to provide me with a p-value so I can determine its significance, I want to know whether P is less than 0.05 or not. So how do I do this? There's some good news here. For everyone in the audience that does not like to do math, there's some very, very good news. You don't need to. You do not need to calculate P because somebody else did it for you, and they made this handy-dandy table, depending on what test you're going to do, there is a table, and you can look this up and find out what your p-value is based on your test statistic. But there are some things that you need to know in order to use the table properly to gather what your p-value is. So step one, you need, you need to run the study, and you need to calculate the test statistic. So the test statistic, as we saw before, is the measured or observed average and that will give us this dark blue area. So of course I need to know what this test statistic is to determine our boundary here for the area. So run your study, calculate your test statistic, that's later videos, we'll talk about that, they're all very different depending on the test, but you calculate your test statistic, and then you need to determine if you are going to run a one-tail or a two-tail test. So this will determine if you put all of your eggs in one basket over here on the one side, or if you split the difference and have some of it on the other side. But you need to de determine that. Generally speaking, a two-tailed test is deemed more uh, credible than a one-tailed test because it is a smaller area that you are trying to achieve with a two-tailed test. So you figure that out, and then you need to determine your alpha, you have to make sure that you know what alpha is. Usually alpha is 0.05, but you need to know what your parameters are. You have to define your terms, define what area is significant. So have that, you need to know that because that's going to go into the chart. And then finally, you need to determine your degrees of freedom. And this is related to the number of people or number of animals, whatever, you are studying the number of samples, uh, so your sample size minus one 
gives us our degrees of freedom. So if I have a study that has 35 people, I take n of 35 and I subtract 1. So I get an n or I get a degrees of freedom of 34. And I'll probably make a separate video on degrees of freedom and and how we think through that because it's a bit of a concept to work through. But basically, this is the number of values that are free to vary. And what I mean by this, let's say you have three marbles and you put those three marbles into a hat. One marble is red, one marble is green, and one marble is blue. And I'm going to pull one marble at a time out of the hat. So the first time I pull a marble out, I have the option of either pulling a red, a green, or a blue. So there are three possibilities there that I can take. So I take out one marble. Let's say I take out the red marble. And then I do not put it back. So that first try, I had three choices to pick from. But now I've excluded the red marble. So now the next time that I'm going to take a marble, it's going to be either the blue one or the green one. So let's say I take the green one and I do not put it back. The third time that I reach in to take a marble, there is only one option. I no longer have a choice. There's no longer a variable. It will. It is guaranteed to be the blue marble. So in that example, of the three marbles, there are only two opportunities to get a different result, depending on that probability. So... That last chance, whatever marble is left, is guaranteed to be the marble I take. So the degrees of freedom, in this case, with my three marbles, there are two degrees of freedom. Two possibilities that could be variable. But the third one cannot vary, so it is excluded. And this is why sample size is so important, because you are going to subtract one. So a higher sample size is better, because it will give you the maximum degrees of freedom, and it will give you a greater likelihood of significance. So I determine all of these things, and then I go to look at my p-value chart, which is very handy. So I, I look at my chart, and it looks something like this. We have on the vertical, we have the degrees of freedom, and then on the top, we have our values of alpha, and there are numbers aligning with each of these categories all the way filling this square. So let's do a little bit of an ex example to familiarize yourselves with how this table works. Uh, let's say that my sample size is three. So I have my three marbles. My degrees of freedom, as we mentioned, is two. Uh, so I'm going to go to my table, and I'm going to note that Two is my degrees of freedom. So I'm going to be looking at this line here of numbers that would fall in line with two. And then when I run my test, uh, whether it's a T test or a Z test or a chi square, whatever you got, it's going to give me a number, and that is the test statistic. I'm going to plug, I'm going to look at my table along this horizontal here that aligns with two. So somewhere on here, I'm going to find a number that's very similar to the number I calculated in my test statistic. So let's say, I don't have an exact number, but let's say this number right here happens to be in line with two. So this is, and this is most similar to our test statistic. So I'm going to circle this. And then taking this, I look up at what my alpha level is. And in this case, the alpha level is 0.1. So, this is not significant because the area under here is under this box of 0.1. This is not, our, so our p-value is, is going to be 0.1, and it is not significant. Um, sometimes you're going to have a number that does not fit exactly with one of these alphas um so you might have to go in between some and that in that case you'd say it's a p is in between 0.05 and 
but either way, you can determine if if it is greater than 0.05, it is not significant, like our number here. If, let's say, my test statistic was under the number that said 0.01, that would be significant in that case. So the table is a little bit confusing, and I apologize for that. I can do a separate video explaining this table, and in fact, when we go into our tests, like our t-test and our z-test, this will make a lot more sense because we will have numbers to plug in and we will be able to look at what we get for the p-value. But this is just an intro to what we are getting into. I promise this is less confusing than it looks right now. So thank you for sticking with me. Stay curious, everyone, and I will see you all in the next one.